It was clear we had to do more in order to prepare Mississippi for a radiation emergency. We had to integrate radiation safety into the public health preparedness program more prominently than we had before. I'm B.J. Smith. And I'm Jim Cray. And together, we have over 60 years of experience in emergency preparedness at the Mississippi State Department of Health. Prior to 2012, preparedness funds went towards increasing public health and laboratory readiness for bioterrorism and chemical emergencies. Many states didn't pay a lot of attention to radiation emergencies outside of the areas around power plants and developing a statewide capacity for radiation emergency response wasn't a funding priority. We decided to change that in Mississippi and began a multi-year effort to develop the tools, training, and relationships we needed to ensure we could respond during a radiation emergency. But first, we had to show our partners why statewide radiation emergency preparedness was important, which required us to define and communicate the roles public health and clinical professionals would be expected to play during a radiation emergency. Early on, CDC's radiation program offered us the opportunity to work together on a set of preparedness toolkits for clinicians and public health practitioners. Then in 2011, we worked with Dr. Armin Ansari at CDC to serve on the planning committee for the Bridging the Gaps Radiation Preparedness Conference in Atlanta. At that conference, we were able to promote radiation awareness at a national level and share why state level roles and operations were needed in a radiation emergency. Both the toolkits and conference presentations helped Mississippi and other states make the case to community stakeholders that radiation preparedness is important. And it helped us leverage new and existing funding to build our tools and training capacity. Our first objective was to improve the tools we had to respond to a radiation emergency. We worked to allocate public health emergency preparedness funds for radiation detection equipment. After a couple of rounds of purchases, we were able to equip our staff and volunteers with a number of different resources. Tools like portal monitors, Tyvek suits, N95 masks, portable survey meters, and isotope analyzers. But we needed more than just equipment. We also needed to develop training materials that would prepare our staff and volunteers for their roles in a community reception center, or CRC. Developing that training started at CDC's Bridging the Gaps Conference, where we met up with Dr. Lisa McCormick from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. With her help, we secured a grant from CDC through the Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors. That grant allowed us to develop training videos for each station at a community reception center. Having the tools and training in hand, we decided to take the next step in 2013 and host our first CRC exercise, Magnolia Blossom. That exercise gave our preparedness plan and processes a stress test. It also provided an opportunity for Dr. Ansari and some folks from CDC, along with Dr. McCormick, to see our operation in action and provide feedback that made our preparedness plan stronger and more useful. Magnolia Blossom reinforced the importance of building and maintaining good relationships with our partners. It also emphasized the need for routine outreach to our volunteers and a robust system to organize talent and training. As a result, we distribute additional information on our department's preparedness activities. We travel and help train public health nurses on community reception center concepts and the roles and responsibilities nurses may have when operating one. It also encouraged us to implement a new volunteer database, the Mississippi Responder Management System, or Mr. Mias, so we can easily provide updates and notifications of additional training opportunities to those who need them. One of CDC's strongest assets is the technical capability they bring to our discussions and trainings. Perhaps the most important example was the Bridging the Gaps Conference, where Dr. Ansari and Dr. Charles Miller provided the information we needed to explain the importance of radiation emergency preparedness to our stakeholders. 
I don't think we would be as far as we are now in Mississippi, or in fact the country, if it wasn't for those two individuals and their teams. Going forward, we continue to invest in relationships, not only by maintaining the skills of our volunteers, but also by engaging hospitals, Medical Reserve Corps volunteers, EMS, and other community members with overlapping expertise. We also invest in a culture of continuous improvement. We identify opportunities for growth and development in our after action reports and make the changes we need to improve how we train, communicate, and support our radiation emergency response teams here at the Mississippi State Department of Health. I'm really proud of the credibility our health departments receive from working on radiation emergency planning with our local partners. When visitors arrive for a meeting or training exercise, they're all amazed at how well Mississippi partners work together. The one thing I've learned in over 40 years of emergency response is the value of our relationships with our partners. Planning is great, having the right equipment is important, and training people to do the work is essential. But after serving as the incident commander for the ESF-8 response to Hurricane Katrina and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, I found time and again that it's the relationships we form before the emergency that really make all of this work. Our neighboring states and partners have helped us in our times of need, and we've gladly stepped up to return the favor. We're all doing our best to be prepared individually, but being able to pick up the phone and call on each other to work side by side is what really makes us strong when responding to a radiation emergency.